Pat, what's going on, brother? <laughs> now I can hear you. <laughs> How's everything? I'm good. How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I appreciate you hopping on so last minute. This is awesome. You know, I just figured I'm trying to uh, save space for serendipity. So I was like, whatever. And early, you know what it is? I, I'm with the kids the whole week and, I, you know, off the grid. But so I don't want to agree to scheduling anything. So yeah. it actually works. I only say yes to something that happens immediately. <laughs> is this the last week before school for the kids? Yeah. And like, you know how it is, right? Like I want to be available when they're like, dad, can you take me driving or something? So I don't want to have things that are unless they're a crisis. So that's how I've been approaching it of which yeah. there are still many on this calendar. <laughs> like that. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, if you don't mind me asking where we're already recording, um, okay. uh, I'm curious to learn how you, how you fit that in your schedule, right? Like you're, you're a busy dude. Like yeah. it ain't easy, you know, um, obviously family is very important. So I understand that's prioritized, but is there anything like tactical that you're deploying to ensure that it's like, okay, cool. Like this is the time for the kids. This is the time for family, et cetera. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, you say that because Kevin O'Leary is a close friend, right. And shark, he, he always puts out a lot of content, which is like smelling salt. It's very, uh, binary, you know, you, you you're going to, something's going to have to give, it's either choose your company or your, or your, or your family or your you know life. And I always think there's, there is a third source of untapped energy and capacity. And that is you. Right. Like, mm -hmm. so what I mean by that is you definitely have to make a choice. Like there's a lot of nonsense acting like you can have perfect balance and whatnot and draw boundaries when you're a founder and entrepreneur, like that's not true, but there is a place where you can boy draw boundaries. And that's about being intentional about how the choices you make for your life. Right. So for example, I married my best friend mm -hmm. and therefore I have a very self-sufficient ecosystem. I could literally hang out with her day and night. It's like, I married the coolest woman in the world and we do everything together. And so my need for friends I have some, right? But it's a very small group. My need for socialization is very limited. So I've gained more capacity now by marrying my best friend, right? I My job and my work is completely integrated with my hobby. It's joyful for me. It feels like painting most of the time. So I don't have a need to go play pickleball an hour every night, you know, with my with my buddies from college, right? Like, so, and then, and then in terms of what's my hard and fast boundary that I know is going to break my heart if I don't respect. And I try not to have too many of them so I don't have to be rigid. And the most important one is being available for moments around my kids that are serendipitous, right? Like, you know, hey, will you take me to get school supplies? If like, mm -hmm. if I'm not there because I committed to something, especially something frivolous, like getting a drink, you know, or whatever, or playing golf, like that's going to break my heart. So I'm very, very, very disciplined about boundaries. And, and I'm honest with people when they're all like, I don't go to anything. <laughs> like, you want to go to this? I was like, no, because I want to be around in case my kid wants to take me, wants me to take him to school in the morning. Yeah, I respect that so much. Um, you mentioned it's about knowing ball. yourself. Like, there's times when I didn't live that way, and I felt like my head was in a vice. And mm. I don't think we talk a ton about the dad role in society still. And so, I just one felt underrepresented or un yeah. like not advocated for, right? Kind of unsupported by the rhythms of society. And then two, just felt like, well, this is this is very unsatisfying. No amount of success is going to eclipse the longing I feel for not being present in their life. So I just have these hard and fast boundaries, very small social life. People always think, oh, you have such a big life. I was like, actually, I have a pretty small life and, and I mm. like it that way. What do you think's not spoken about in regards to the dad role? Now, I'm not a dad, but I mean, ideally one day, if that's in the cards, you know, for me, I would love that. But like, what's not spoken enough about in regards to that? I don't, th I think there's a couple of stats out there that are sort of known one is, for example, the suicide rate among men post-divorce is very high. Mm. And there's sort of, you know, there's general understanding of what it means to go through a divorce. But I don't think we talk enough about how much of that is like getting your heart ripped out and your face ripped off. How much of your identity and self-worth uh, is stripped away when you go through that process. And mm. why I think that's important is not from a, oh, poor me or poor anyone. It's more you need some accommodations as a man going through a divorce and some degree of understanding, I think is almost absent from society. There's a presumption that, you know, you're going to go run off and do your own thing, or I don't really know. And then I talk to men who are going through it and they deal with substance abuse issues. They deal with depression. So I don't think we talk about that topic enough. Yeah. And then generally as a dad, just how many men out there really want to do that job? Well, like mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons, and really find it hard to create the space to do it well. However, 
life has got better in a post COVID world with the flexibility. However, that's about to change <laughs> going into the recession. So a lot of the things that I think we have gotten used to um, men and women uh, from a rhythm of life are about to change over the next uh, 12 months. From your experience, what do you think it takes to do quote unquote dad? Well, like what, what does that take? Such a good question. I do think there's, we can't escape our own prism and we can't mm. escape the patterns that govern us. We try, I mean, we should meditate on trying to break them. So it is going to be distorted by whatever you lacked. And now I think, I think people have two responses to when you were lacking something or deprived of something, you could deny it to others because it was denied to you a degree of like tough love or hazing, I guess, mm. or you could be aware of how much a void that left and you could laser focus on it and amplify it. The problem is, of course, now you're overcorrecting and the pendulum is swinging too far the other day. So I'd make that less, uh, let's make that uh, less abstract. You know, I didn't have a strong dad presence in my life um, and I'm being charitable with those sentences, with those words. So that probably makes me a helicopter parent, you know, mm. with not the most perfect boundaries <laughs> and not really, not really a disciplinarian. I don't need to be, I have amazing, amazing kids, but so we're always overcorrecting. So I guess what makes a great dad is trying to balance, give your kids what you were denied but not overemphasize it because too much of anything is never a good thing. Right. So I, I think the most, but the most important part of being a good dad is being present mentally and emotionally and physical physically is far down the list. And I think there you can fall into a trap because you're under so much duress where you're kind of checking the box. Like I'm here, I took him to Toys R Us or well, that's gone now, you know, whatever, whatever. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, like we confuse um, physical presence with uh, emotional presence. And so I just think, and then for me, being a, being a dad is about just trying to convey unconditional love and making sure your children don't fall into the trap where they feel like they need to emulate you for you to respect them. Because Absolutely. if you're somebody who's uber successful, whatever that means, in your context, you are going to have to fight the fact that your kids are going to believe that the way to your love and respect is to emulate you. And that's mm -hmm. like the worst thing you do to your kids. Like, so I try to work hard. Uh, I'm sure I'm not getting this right either, but like of conveying, like the, the way to earn my respect is your self-acceptance, even if it manifests in the most random ways, guitar player, whatever the hell you want to be. Like to me, winning as a parent is for your children to have self-acceptance regardless of their life choices, as long as they're not personally destructive, objectively personally destructive. Absolutely. You hit on honestly, one of my biggest fears, and this isn't just in parenting. Like I said, I'm not a parent yet, but the projection of our conditioning onto others, right? And that could be in anything, right? That could be in your business. That could be in your relationship. That could be on your kids. So I appreciated you breaking that down. But like I said, that's one of my biggest fears. And it's just like, you know, you grow up a certain way, you either are going to do that, or maybe you hated it, you do the opposite of it. So again, it comes down to that word you used earlier balance, you know? Um, so yeah, I, well, for, I me, for me, the, um, the, I'm so acutely aware of the void that it created not having that role, and then also being a mm -hmm. caregiver as a young kid, like, I know what that did to me, what that distorted in me and what that denied me. And then once I have had a kid, I was like, Oh, my God, like, that is such a strong presence to have parent. That's where your unconditional love comes from. But then it makes you somewhat neurotic about supplying it. And then everyone's <laughs> overdosing on your hypervigilance, like chill the fuck out, you know? So, yeah. you know, it's inescapable. You're going to do it. I think winning is when your kids push back. I think, you know, you've won when your children have the confidence to be able to challenge you on the ways in which you're kind of getting it wrong by, you know, overcorrecting. Like, you know, when that happens in your life, you're like, all right, because the the absence of that is suppression until they're on a couch when they're 30. And by then those are pretty deeply ingrained. So if your children and adolescents are like, you're such a fuck, you know, whatever you're like, all right, I'm winning. You have the confidence to tell me that. And you know, you're Absolutely. not going to be beaten into submission. I love that. I love it. I actually want to move back right into it. Huh? We just started. I love that. No <laughs> we just dove right in. I hate preambles and introductions. This is perfect. Yeah. We just we just roll here. I mean, this is just the conversation. I think that's what makes for, you know, the best of podcasts in general. But I actually want to move backwards a little bit because you said something and it kind of intertwines with a piece of content I saw that you put out on social recently. You just use the term knowing yourself. And I'm going to leave it open ended and just trying to find out what that process was like for you to understand who Matt is at his core. 
Yeah, I mean, that's that I'm not going to give you the cliche answer, but the cliche is true. Like it is still very much a work in progress because I keep knocking down mm-hmm. barriers of inner discovery. Right. So I'll give you one example of inner discovery was the amplification of the boogeyman this ever present threat that's going to destroy my life and send me back to housing court or send me back to that rat hole apartment. I grew up in Queens, the Roach Motel, or send me back to the eve of my mom's death, right? Like there's a lot of like bombs going off in my brain in the middle of the night, very nightmarish, you know? I had to, the first door to knock down was to convince myself that I was safe objectively, not in some nonsensical therapeutic way. Like, no, you have enough liquidity that you are not going back to that. That was number one, right? So then you knock down that barrier to inner discovery. It's like, I'm going deeper and deeper into, you know, into the matrix. Right. And then, uh, so anyway, to fast forward, I think for me uh, and anyone out there who um, was forced to be a caregiver as a young kid or sort of distorted that unconditional love phase, be, being selfish as a um, juvenile is a really important part of your development. It's when you learn the self. What do I need? What do I want? And I, I sort of bypassed that phrase phase by becoming a parent. Started working when I was 10, you know, and then my mom passed away when I was 26. So a lot of the work of inner discovery is like, okay, what do I want? Like, what does it mean to want as opposed mm-hmm. to uh, to be responsible, which I have been responsible for my whole life and very heavy jobs, heavy scenarios, then children and all that. What is it? What do I want? So a lot of for me to know thyself is really understanding what I would have wanted if I had gone through that process that is typical as an adolescent and sort of developed a little bit stronger sense of of uh, of self in that way. Right. And uh, and that's been a, an interesting journey. I mean, even to this day of being like, OK, where are my boundaries? What do I want? What do I enjoy? What what what, what feels good? What is not a soothing mechanism for some lingering trauma, which is the challenge a lot of us have who have any kind of scar tissue is a lot of the things you think you want are actually soothing for the things that were done to you or yeah, happened to you. Absolutely. Now, in regards to the fear that you had to work through where you had to teach yourself that you were safe, where did that fear stem from? Like, did you get brought back or did you feel like you were moving backwards in life in numerous different capacities in the past? Like where did that stem, uh, that, that fear stem from? And I'll share this and especially for anyone listening who can relate or is in it or went through it, but back to the parentif- parentifying, like it was my job as a little boy. It was also my identity that to save everyone, yeah. you know, including my disabled parent. Right. And that one started as an obligation I didn't understand, then one I didn't even want, then one I begrudgingly accepted when I realized the cavalry wasn't coming. I was like, is anybody going to step here and save her or whatever? And then one I, I took into my own hands when I dropped out of high school when I was 16, got left back every year when I was starting when I was 14 years old to run my play, which is to burn the boats, drop out of high school, get my GD and go to college. That became my my identity, right? But the backdrop of everything is like, it's not safe. It's not safe mm-hmm. to count on parents. It's not safe to count on society. And it's technically not safe because there's a marshal's notice on your door saying we're going to be evicted and Con Edison just shut off the electricity. So like that when you are subjected to that for a very long period of time and it becomes your self-esteem, because not mm-hmm. only was it a threat, it was also validation of who I am as a person, right? Now I'm now, and my nickname became Doogie Howser when I was a kid, which is a show about a doctor who is like 12 or 14, you know? So, so you have two negative reinforcements, one, the danger is ever present Two, I derive my self-esteem from it. So that's a lot of entrenchment over time where it's like, oh, I got, I got to work through this. So that's where the hype, the hypervigilance came from technically surrounding my environment all the time, trying to understand where I stand. And then the identity re, uh, reinforced it. We're really good. So, I like sharing this stuff in case there's somebody out there who's like, oh my God, you just articulated what I feel. Oh, I, I relate to it tremendously. I'm also born and raised in Queens, by the way. So the, oh, there's a connection please. here. Um, <laughs> Where, uh, shout out to Queens. Uh, middle Village. Middle Village. Middle Village born right and raised. on uh, Q27. Is middle, no, no. Middle Village is near Woodhaven Boulevard, right? And w- That is correct. Right. Yes, Metro. So I used to work at the um, Quick Stop on Woodhaven and Metro. It's a okay. little deli. It might be gone before you, right where the Q11 would stop. No, uh, it's still there. It's still there. Yeah. yeah. yeah I just passed it yesterday. Stop. Yeah, the quick stop. <laughs> and I used to work on the overnight shift at the quick stop deli. Shout out to the quick that's, stop. That is crazy. My uh, oh, my dad that. actually, he, that's so funny. My dad had a house right down the block. That's it's such a small Seriously? world. Seriously, that's amazing. Yeah, I worked for Aubrey Tula Avenue. And, and Kathy, uh, the wonderful Greek family that are still in my heart. Yeah, that is, that's wild. But um, I, 
the reason I say that is because I resonate with what you're sharing tremendously. And it, it leads me to ask you, did you ever feel like your identity at that point was connected to pain? Like, did you feel like your identity was pain? Because it almost sounds like pain is what was fueling you to an extent. And you can correct me if I'm wrong. I haven't lived your life, but I'm just trying to decode that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, pain has been pain. Pain was the ever present uh, and just frustration, desperation. But then pain also became became uh, a, a useful catalyst uh, mm. that I still tap into into this day. Right? I mean, the reality, our relationship with pain, uh, you know, there is a duality. Right? I mean, one we try to avoid it, one we try to soothe it. But the pain of pursuit is the very thing that propels us. Right? And that's a big premise of my book, Burn the Boats, is this idea that we we tell ourselves we conjure back our plans in order to be prudent. But in reality, what the science shows is we conjure back a plan to alleviate the pain of pursuit of wanting something so bad that may not work out. And then mm -hmm. we conjure like, oh, but what if I instead of the marathon, I could run a half marathon, you know? So, so yeah, there has been a degree of pain. I've tried to um, harness that now in a much more self-inflicted way. You know what I mean? Like, let's be intentional about the pain I subject myself to and to begin to look at pain as a feedback loop, uh, not necessarily yeah. as, as a thing to be soothed. Absolutely. Is there... Any advice, maybe a step-by-step -step for you to give our listenership to start utilizing their pain as fuel, as opposed to something to run from or hide from, et cetera? Yeah. And I guess it depends on the, on the context, but to understand, I mean, there's tons of sunny Instagram posts about it, but sometimes they're not very actionable. Like pain in every, in, in many different contexts is really just a feedback loop. So let's mm -hmm. use it, the pain of imposter syndrome as a perfect example, right? The pain of, of, um, of lack of belonging and feeling like a pain of discovery or anticipated discovery of being a fraud. Those types of pain are actually just your mind saying, I don't have any neural networks here. I've never gone down this pathway. I have no tracks here. And so mm -hmm. what's it doing? It's, it's sending signals to you be like, I'm, I'm uncomfortable. I've got nothing to, to, to draw upon. And I always think about those moments. I know it sounds crazy. I always remember like, why the hell do we want to listen to Goodnight Moon on a loop when we're babies all the time? And it's because the familiarity is very soothing. We already have neural tracks as a baby. We've heard it before. We know what to expect. And so just remember that your brain is hardwired to be efficient because it wants to conserve carbohydrates. It wants to mm -hmm. conserve glycogen right, to survive. And so when you put your brain in a place where it has to work harder than the base case, your pain, your brain sends signals back to you like, I'm fucking uncomfortable. So, so that I use that is I think anybody listening to me, I'm like, oh, that's actually true. That's a good point. So imposter syndrome is your reflexive reaction to it, to it, to make you evacuate uh, from that situation. So now let's consider the alternative imposter syndrome, familiarity, mediocrity, mundane existence, drudgery, repetition, like all the things that don't make life very interesting. So I say, all right, I have a choice. I can choose the pain of imposter syndrome or I could choose the uh, lull of complacency of mediocrity. And while one it feels it will not inflict any pain whatsoever, but it also won't uh, deliver the promise of reward of joy. And that's my mm -hmm. relationship with risk. My whole point about writing the book was I wanted to write a book for those who, for whom risk taking doesn't come naturally this bombastic phrase that we've heard that's usually used by, you know, a military context, usually associated with screw everybody, right? I want to appropriate it for the risk adverse and the anxiety laden because while somebody out there listening or a lot of people, probably almost half will say, I'm not a natural risk taker. You are a natural risk wanter because you know mm. that on the other side of risk comes reward. So everybody's a risk wanter and not everybody's a risk taker. And I think by calling yourself not a risk taker, you're self-selecting out of ambition. You're denying yourself the pursuit of pain that will eventually lead you to the full expression of your potential. I tried to write in a narrative form, so it wouldn't be boring as hell, a book about <laughs> different illustrations of people who subjected themselves to pain so that they could go from being a risk wanter but not a risk taker to a risk acceptor and mm -hmm. provide a risk matrix so that you could change your life. So long way of saying, I just, but again, hopefully that's a specific enough example of pursuit of pain. Absolutely. I'm curious why you opted to use the example of imposter syndrome. Is that something you feel like you struggled with? Oh, for sure. I mean, when I, when I was, a, I shared that it's interesting. We all have a choice, right? And this is great, yeah. this interview, because we did zero prep. I have not even had a conversation before with Matt. Like we just started <laughs> like, and I feel like we all have a choice. We can paper over the present feelings and things we struggle with 
and we could make them as if they're in the rear view mirror and then offer them to the world, which I think is 90% of what's quoted, you know, gurus do on Instagram, which is like, I once struggled, I got through it. I now have the answers. Let me share them from the top. And to me, that actually does a disservice because it implies that that people get over things. In reality, none mm. of us get over things. We only manage things. They're always sort of present. So what, the point of that story is to say, when I went on Shark Tank, if you watched the, the show of me on the first episode, you would conclude that if I wasn't a natural, I'd be like, he's damn good. He belongs there for sure. You know, whether you hate me or think Kevin O'Leary is better or whatever, you wouldn't conclude that I was an imposter, right? However, on the eve before, I didn't sleep for 48 hours. I was a total mess. I was thinking I was going to compromise my entire life. Everything, I was, uh, this inner catastrophizer went went haywire. And then I, I thought about retreat. I actually conjured in the hotel a whole plan to have Rohan Oza take over my spot. And I was going to pretend I had food poisoning with salmon. And I, I, the only way I got through it was listening to Eminem on a loop, Lose Yourself, to get to the set that morning. And then I went to Damon John and I... And I said to Damon, I pulled him aside. He's from Queens. I thought he's the one guy that I could be honest with. I said, look, man, I, I know it's ridiculous, but I'm freaked out. And I feel like I'm a total fraud. And everyone's going to see that block of government cheese on Springfield Boulevard in Queens. And they're going to be like, what are you doing here? They're going to see my bank account, think it's not big enough, whatever. And Damon gave me the best advice to share in the book that first of all, like, F them. <laughs> they don't understand what it means to come from dirt like we did. But, but second thing, you belong here because you are here. And I know I've mm -hmm. given interviews about this. I just love that statement because it's very Socratic. It's basically telling you there's no final arbiter on belonging. And I was able to summon that, you know, to get through uh, Shark Tank. So what, the reason why I share this is twofold. One, the answer is yes, obviously I still go through imposter syndrome, everybody does. But two, we all have a choice. When we as supposedly self-actualized adults moving up, you know, the hierarchy, like we have a choice, we can act like we're there already and, uh, or we can share present tense, what we mm -hmm. go through. And the reason why present tense is such a gift, because then this conversation is an act of commiserating. It's not Matt seeing like, I have a book, buy my book, I have all the answers. My book is my accountability partner, right? Like mm -hmm. I'm working through it every day. And just because I've seen things and know things and want to share things doesn't mean I'm able to implement those things. And so I would, I would caution anyone out there who is consuming tidy little narratives on Instagram about you know how failure is good. Be careful who you take it from because subconsciously it's also transmitting to you. They have moved on. They have transcended. And then you may beat yourself up like, God, I'm 44. Why haven't I like they have? And so I'm, I'm trying through this book also to share things. And I shared the Shark Tank story. It's a long way that, to say. Yes. That is absolutely what we love to amplify here. So I appreciate that vulnerability. You gave me the chills. I literally have the hair on my oh, arm standing you. up. Thank you. No, I love this uh, topic. I like, I love like, and that's why I like your podcast. Like I like pulling back the curtain. Yeah. Like, what is, you know, we're all going to be dead very soon. So what are we worried about sharing? You know, who cares? Absolutely. Uh, let, let's talk about belonging, you know, from maybe even a spiritual perspective. So like me hearing you share that shark tank story, of course I didn't live that. So I can't speak on if that was me in that scenario. But what do you think about just the fact that you were there being enough of reason or belonging? I mean, you were there. That means you're supposed to be there. Like, what do you feel when you hear that? Um, you know, I hear skepticism, right? Mm. But it takes work to accept it, right? Because yeah. your mind goes, but, but I mean, it's something I've had to work on. For example, this is kind of counterintuitive, but big reason why I wanted to share the struggle in the book was to say, I am the case study of the not natural risk taker from either my environment or the issues I have to overcome anxiety, like everybody else, but nonetheless to persist is to prevail. And so the shark tank is a perfect illustration. There's no template on the internet. Like I want to apply to be Mark Cuban, you know, like you have to <laughs> manifest that shit. Like I worked for a year and everyone's non so bullshit when they're like, they just called me. I'm like, yeah, they just called you. Unless you're Elon Musk, they didn't just call you. Like you also probably worked to get yourself in front of them. But that's a long way of saying, I a hundred percent manifested um, being there, right? But then yeah. I have to overcome a second voice of doubt that says, yeah, but you know how you got there. You know that it was the byproduct of all this work, like the, as if there's something unnatural that it didn't just happen, right? Isn't it like I, I then deny myself the the uh, basking in the glory because I could identify the role I played in achieving it, right? Whereas one should derive pride from, yeah, but you did the work. 
So I'm always sharing the work I did to get the thing so that I'm not being given credit for being unnatural or it spontaneously happened. So that's become my relationship with anything where I undermine my, well, yeah, but you play the central role, like as if there's anything in the world that just happens. But sometimes in my mind, there is still the fairy tale of like, well, some people are just tapped, you know what I mean? Like yeah. some people, and it's not true, but I still, I still struggle with accepting that deep down. Absolutely. Yeah. Would you do anything differently in regards to what you know now versus, you know, when you were on that Sony lot prepping to go on to Shark Tank? Like, would you do anything now in regards to preparation for what Such your mind question. was saying to you and stuff? Yeah, I wish. Uh, I do think when you unfortunately deal with getting your mind right with imposter syndrome or you're over prepare, um, whatever it takes to, to perform at your best something is lost where obviously you don't savor the moment. And then for me, because I'm so forward oriented, I have such a bias towards action. There isn't a long window between completion of the event or exercise and then like basking in it. Right. Um, I keep trying, for example, you know, the book came out and uh, it won, uh, you know, it was bestseller for wall street journal and it's done great. Right. I tried to organize a book party. I really did. Like I, you know, it was like had a vision for it. And then 48 later hours, I was like, I just don't care. I just don't want to party. And then I canceled it. So, mm. you know, it's like, so by, by, to answer your question, I wish I had savored it a little bit more. Uh, and the, the energy of performance, uh, like eclipsed the act of savoring it and the window had closed. Like it had yeah. already been assumed into my identity and I had moved on to, you know, trying to uh, get onto the faculty of Harvard. So that's my regret. I but I don't know. I don't, what can you do? We are who we are, right? I mean, I, I, I try to work on that, but you know. So then there are things in my life that I do absolutely savor. I savor every moment I spend with my wife. So so that's where I'm present, and I savor every moment with the kids. But uh, unfortunately, some stuff the the accolades don't don't register. Yeah. Well, I'm sure you're going to have many more firsts in your life. I mean, you're you're someone that strives for for more and more. So uh, I'm sure you're going to have more firsts and plenty to savor. But in regards to the book. You know, one thing that I was really curious after picking it up, diving through it is just getting deeper on if it's necessary to feel ready on all levels. And what I mean by all levels is mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically. Like, do you need to be ready on all levels to start to burn the boats? Yeah, I, I actually think you need the opposite. You need to lower the bar to your act to taking action across all those domains. And mm. if you think of what people typically do, people typically raise the bar uh, and their barriers to them taking action as a way to, you know, forestall having to deal with whatever lingering issues they have. And so they shift to is what I call a bias towards incrementalism, where they begin to accept these sort of unwritten rules like, well, I can't launch this business until I spend five years here as the VP of marketing so I could learn this. I, I see this in, in um, business school all the time. Very few people, even at the top institutions, who go on to become a consultant, want to become a consultant. They mm -hmm. go to become a consultant because they have accepted this version of incrementalism that says, well, I need to get exposure to all these different businesses and before I can really launch the business that I covet. Now that in the end may prove to have been beneficial, but the construct is usually distorted. It's usually as a way to defer because they don't really know what they're doing next. And so I work hard on and preach and through the book that we should, one, Always choose defiance before we choose acceptance. You could always revert mm. to acceptance, but choose defiance. Like, who made this damn rule? Like, why do I got to be a partner at a firm <laughs> before I can go ahead and, and raise my own money, right? So who made this damn rule is number one. And two, and then two, okay, it, this is not a rejection of expertise, to be honest. Expertise matters. But if you've accumulated enough expertise that in your soul, you really believe you have what it takes, then you should ask, ask then the question should not be, do I have what it takes? Will the world let me do what I need to do? Like, so that mm. we could say, am I being realistic? So for example, you could believe that you have what it takes to be a great investor. You believe that people should give you their money to invest. But if you objectively say, unfortunately, the world is also bought into these unwritten rules of incrementalism, and I have to get this credential to get permission, that's different. That's like, don't fight city hall, don't bark at the moon, you know? But I feel very strongly the opposite, back to your original question, across those four areas, you need to lower the bar. What's the minimum amount that you need to be prepared for? And not to complete the journey, 
but to make the next best decision that moves you in the general direction of your ambition. The problem is people make the, the, uh, the, the gating item, I gotta have it all figured out, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas in reality, you only have to have, you, one, you need to pressure test your assumptions and your risk tolerance. We can get into my risk matrix, but you have to make the next best decision. At Harvard, at the end of every class we ask, um, when I, and I teach this course at HBS, 20 classes in a week, we always ask founders from the most amazing companies in America. And we say, what's the one advice you want to give to you sitting in this room, however many years ago, you have a whole room of future leaders of America, hundred people. What do you want to tell them? Uh, you know, that family feud when they're like survey says 90% <laughs> of people, nice survey says 90% of people who come to that room, these founders, you know what they always say? They say, I wish I would could tell myself like, just go figure it out. You don't mm. need to have all the answers. They always say the same thing. So they long to get back the energy they wasted, believing that they had to have it all figured out. And what they, they say, what I should have worked on is trusting my capacity to be the kind of person who always figures it out. So mm. if you're the person listening to this, that you are the kind of person that always figures it out, I, those are always the ones I want to invest in. When people say, Matt, what do you look for in a founder? I, I, I give a more nuanced approach about confidence, humility, all about self-awareness. But what I'm really looking for is to identify, are you that special person who just everyone would say about, they just always figure it out. And if you are, you, have, you already have what it takes to be successful. I love this. You're, I had a burning question in mind as you were going through that. And Did I make you forget it? No, you did not. I, I'm okay. lucky I keep a pen right next to me. Okay, but excellent. I'm curious to learn if you believe that the human default is to go to incrementalism to avoid imposter syndrome. I 100% believe that, that the human okay. default is to go to incrementalism. But I also believe that we are in a prison, partially of our own making, but partially of the world order. And it is very, very hard to break out of that prison if you don't have somebody mentoring you or telling mm -hmm. you it's okay or holding up a mirror. You know, so for me, for example, for me to go to law school, think about this. I was a high school dropout, had a GD. I spent seven years going to Queens College at night, right? Like I knew that one day I would have to er erase that or else I'd be talking to you right now saying to you like, no, but I was like pretty smart. I wasn't running with the gang. You know, the easier thing to do was to get this law degree that I really was not at all convicted I wanted to use. But if I went mm -hmm. to the top, a top law school and I was on, on law review, which I was, right, at the top of the class, like then I wouldn't have to explain myself. So for me to go through four more years of law school, then get a job offer from Skadden Arps, one of the top five law firms in the world, right? And then to give back the advance and then never take the bar exam. Like I am, I am violating every, you know, conventional rule about incrementalism. But in my mind, I was like, I don't have to be a practicing lawyer to have mm. permission to do what I ultimately want to do. First of all, I'm already making more money working for the government, which is a sad commentary. And then second of all, like, I don't need it. And I, unfortunately, it's okay to construct your own case is my point. It's okay to construct a novel case that you can't find any precedent for. I am probably the only man in the United States with one ball who has a GD and a law degree <laughs> because I had <laughs> testicular cancer, right? So I am one of one. And I love that. When I had cancer after I didn't die, I was like, this is kind of interesting. I'm now sure mm. I'm one of one. It is okay. Anyone listening right now, if you are an edge case, as I call them, which is a fundamental question you have to ask yourself, right, am I an edge case or am I, am I a base case, right? If you're an edge case, you're an outlier, either from the situation you find yourself and how your mind operates, it's okay to uh, construct your own argument for your life that doesn't fit into a template. And often that's where your instincts and pattern recognition came in. So for me, it actually wasn't that complicated. Like even the GED, if we think about that as an example, I had tapped into this idea. If you get your GED and you do well enough, you can convert that to a GPA, right? Mm -hmm. You know, anybody who's gone through high school, which is now everybody listening, realizes that all the math you learned was a total effing waste of time, right? So I just happened to know that a little younger. I was like, I don't need to know trigonometry. Like, I'm probably going to be okay. But if I could graduate high school two years earlier, I can get a job two years earlier. I can tap into compounding earlier. I didn't know this as a kid. This part of it is not true. This is only in hindsight bias. But I could tap into everything. I can get out of poverty. That was me, an edge case, creating a construct for something that for which there was no template. So mm. a big part of my book, Arguing Against Incrementalism, is um, give yourself permission to consider there is another way. 
And there's a, and I'll stop talking about this. a delightful story in my book about this kid from uh, Harvard, one of my classes. He was a special operator uh, in, in Iraq. Guy, crazy IQ, like understands what kind of weapons need to be deployed. Just had the whole picture, had worked, I think, in the Defense Innovation Unit, understood what gets funded, had everything it would take to create a fund. And he comes to my office to see me on the eve of taking a job at a soul crushing private equity firm in New York. And he looks kind of sad. And I was like, what's wrong? He's like, I mean, I really want to, you know, I'd love to just create my own fund, but, you know, I can't. And I'm like, well, why? He's like, I haven't been a managing director at a fund yet. And so I can't. I'm like, oh, I didn't. That's a rule. Shit, I'd, I better start vetting all the people I back, all these checks I write to make sure that person was had a managing director on their resume. I was like, I actually don't know what the hell you're talking about. He's like, no, that's generally the understanding. And I was like, why don't you go out and raise the money? He's like, who's going to give me money? And I was like, no one is going to give you money until somebody gives you money. And then mm -hmm. you've gotten money. And then it begins. No bullshit. Walks out of my office. See you later. Calls me a couple of months later, three months later and says, hey, what's your size? Give me your or text me. What's your size? I'm like, what do you need my size for? I want to send you swag. I said, for what? For the firm I created when I walked out of your office. I wow. went ahead. I made 100 phone calls. No one would give me money. And then somebody did. And now this is the greatest thing that's ever happened in my life. Just two weeks ago, big article in the Wall Street Journal about how that guy raised $70 million from JP Morgan for round two of his fund. And I'm an investor in it. So... Yes, that's a long way of answering your first question. Do we humans have a bias towards incrementalism? We do, but it's not just that. You are pressured into incrementalism as well. Yeah, I love this. Uh, Matt, I only have you for a few more minutes, so I'm going to start squeezing some questions okay, out of fine. here. Okay, fine. I'll be faster and tighter. We're just having fun. No, no, no. We're, yeah. we're good. I'm, I'm not telling you to be. We're, we're no, having no, combo no, no, here. No, I'm, just, I'm just saying. Yeah. Um, these are a few questions that I always ask in interviews just because I think it's my job at this point. But the first one being... What is a question you wished more people would ask you and how would you answer it? How do I become self-aware? Okay. Because you've talked that, about self-awareness on social. I'm curious. Let's dive yeah. into this. How do I become self-awareness? Because that means if somebody's asking me that question, that means they're on the eve of accepting that not being self-aware is ruining their life. So that, that okay. is a delightful question. And then I would say to them, <clears throat> you begin by sharing something that you're afraid to share because you think the act of exposure is going to negatively affect your life or your happiness, mm. take a risk and share one thing. And when you share it, you'll discover not only were you not judged or did it not matter, but you relieved another human in your life to share something similar that they thought it was uh, dangerous. You now become create a domino that will spread throughout your life and that will create a feed feedback loop that will make you more confident to look within and face whatever it is you're afraid to face. Mm. What were you scared to share? I think the um, I had a whole fake narrative around why I dropped out of high school that it was because you know I was unchallenged. So that was, so I think sharing sharing the parentification part because it feels a little bit um, critical of my mom and you know mm. like it's nuanced. I think it's just sharing all that. I don't know if it's afraid, but just unreconciled to sharing it. Part of it, I also didn't want to share it until there was enough people paying attention so I could have more of an impact. So those two things were toggling. I had an excuse for not sharing it, but the reality is yeah. I, I also just, I just didn't want to share it. So it, it leads me to ask you this, like how important is it that we know who we're sharing the message with? Because, you know, you're talking about creating some sort of like domino effect to an extent, like, does it matter who we're sharing that message with? You no, know, it does. Very good point. There are people who are, who, well, I talk in the book about different archetypes of naysayers, but one of them are where, where is it coming from? But there is a place where it's coming from where people really try to undermine your ambition when you're trying to take yourself out of a box because mm. it's really threatening their own identity. They put themselves in a box a long time. More importantly, they probably have a victim mindset where they feel like somebody else put them in the box. So they're a little bit like, where do you get off? You get to get out of the box, but I've been stuck here, you know? So it is important who you generally a little bit to share with, but the the answer to that or the counter is share it more broadly. You know what I mean? Okay. Like make sure you, and also make sharing an act of unburdening, not in, with an expectation of what happens. Like I'm a hundred percent positive. Even if you share something slightly uncomfortable with that rigid human who's put themselves in a box and maybe has a victim mindset, you're still going to have an impact on that person, even if you don't perceive it. So mm. share it as an act of unburdening yourself and then share it as an act of philanthropy, but no, with no expectation of having evidence of the domino, right? Because if Absolutely. you have evidence, you'll be like, well, nothing happened. Well, that, 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 then that defeats the purpose. So I'm curious how we remove that expectation because I, I think, and this might 
go hand in hand to an extent here. I feel like men in general who are vulnerable are taught in society these days that they'll be rewarded for it. And oftentimes that happens in the realm of dating, where if a guy is vulnerable with a woman, they're rewarded with something from that woman in some capacity. How do we remove the expectation? And I guess, you know, this is a man to man conversation. So that's really what I'm getting at. How do we remove the expectation of anything in regards to what we share? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, look, I think, uh, you know, now we're typecasting men, but let's just lean into it. I, I think uh, everybody has a desire to be self-possessed, right? And to be mm -hmm. self-possessed is very attractive. So if you just accept the fact that the act of sharing vulnerability is not an, an attempt to be manipulative, it's an attempt to be self-possessed because the less you carry, the lighter you move, the more mm -hmm. nimble you are, the more that has been shed. It shouldn't be an act of manipulating for a response. It should be an act of hacking yourself. All right, I'm lighter now. Like, I don't give a shit. You know what? I acknowledge that I have this problem. I acknowledge that I binge eat at 11 a.m. And if you leave me to my own advices, all the Doritos will be gone when you wake up, which is a fact, by the way. I used to conceal them all the time. My wife would be like, she'd find them all in my pockets. And like, <laughs> like, you know what I do? I used, to, I used to do, I mean, this is only like recently overcome this in the last couple of years, but I would eat all the chips and then I would, I would redistribute the garbage and put it on the bottom thinking she won't get to it. Not forgetting that the bag is translucent, right? And she'd see it at the bottom of it. <laughs> And so like, but, but my only point is let's use that as an uncomfortable detail that I just shared mm -hmm. that I used to always have this relationship with, with binging and soothing or, you know, some version of it. Like um, by sharing that, am I trying to get somebody to feel pity for me or to think that like, I don't know, or mm -hmm. do I accept the fact that even anybody listening to this right now who has a secret and is like, Ooh, that's cringy. He shared it. You at the same time are, are now admiring me for having the confidence to share that, right? Just mm -hmm. so as a man, just remember, it is very attractive and and it shouldn't be about generating a response. It should be about now you're lighter. There's one less thing you're concealing. There's one less thing you're managing. Like the less you have to manage about the self, the more effective you'll be, the more self-possessed you'll, you'll come off as. What led you to discover that? Like that, that is something I'm really curious about because these are good conversations man to man. Yeah, I think it's honestly a degree of pattern recognition, right? It does begin by realizing what's the power of sharing and how mm -hmm. does that generate a response? So it probably starts from a place of the exact opposite that I'm preaching. It probably does start from a place of like getting what you want, maybe, or you know what I mean? Like, oh, that's shockingly vulnerable. And then, but then you start realizing like, that's the wrong motive, actually. The motive here is it does make me act much more, much more confident. Mm -hmm. And like, and, 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 and almost to be honest, you have to block out the, re the reaction of reception to your sharing of vulnerability, because that in and of itself is an act of dependency. Now you can only share if it's effective now. And now you're dependent upon adulation or, and I yeah. think the more ways you can work on not being dependent upon reception and adulation, the better you'll be. Like, I love Gary Vaynerchuk. He's my partner. Right? We walked we, we can't walk down the street without Gary being, you know, uh, stopped every like nanosecond. It actually fills me with such dread, not because, um, I can't handle the notoriety. Obviously, you know, it happens to me to an extent, not, nothing like him. It's because I never want to be dependent upon it. I never want mm. to like it. I mean, I'm not wired to like it anyway, but man, I like, so I would argue to anybody who really wants to achieve a superior level of peace, like work on not needing a reaction to, to your behavior or the adulation. Now being intentional that. when you need to generate it because you need people to be bought in, you need to lead, that's different. But as a base case, don't sit around walking all day and think about like, if I share vulnerability, I'm going to get what I want. Yeah. Now you've given us a ton already, Matt, in regards to advice, actionable steps, etc. I'm curious to hear your reply to this. This question was actually asked to me by Dr. Michael Gervais on the show. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to ask it to every single person after this, because it's such a good question, in my opinion. If I knew what Matt knows, how would my life be different? you would find yourself achieving things you never remotely thought possible that you had talked yourself out of a long time ago, or that somebody in your life had told you it was grandiose. Mm. You would, I believe in a very matrix way, when he slows the bullets down, you would, <laughs> you would see the underlying codes and realize that from every crisis is born an opportunity, but you must first believe it and then to mine for it, right? Mm -hmm. You would know that and you would face every crisis with 
a degree of excitement because you know you're going to discover something magnificent through it and that it's not just rhetoric. And so every type of situation you face that creates dread would be balanced with a degree of nervous excitement because you're like, I can't wait for the universe to tell me what it wants to share with me. And that is not bullshit. Every single bad thing I have gone through, even the death of my mother as how mm. much that has traumatized me, the empathy that it birthed towards people who are powerless, are struggling, who are disabled, who are single mothers, will create a bigger impact on this world than my mother was able to achieve with her life, mm. right? And so anyway, that's one example of how you'd see things differently. You would embrace the burn the boats mindset and realize it's not just rhetoric, that when you fully commit and surrender to a goal and you give yourself no option for retreat, you can achieve spectacular things. I love that. We're going to make sure the link to the book is in the show notes of this episode, as well as socials, websites, et cetera. Do you have anything else going on that we should make people aware of before I ask you a couple last questions? No, no, that's it. The book, the book is my passion. And the, and the, the, the this is taking, it takes a lot of emotional energy to keep pushing a book and I'm pushing it yeah. because I know that I'm holding up a mirror to people out there. So if you happen to read the book and it moves you, just DM me because you then give me another day. Every DM buys me another day of this unrelenting energy and you're going to impact somebody else by sending me that DM. I read every single one of them. So DM me on LinkedIn or Instagram. I love that. If people pick up this book, when they pick up this book, they can only take one thing away from it. What do you want that one thing to be? Confirmation. Confirmation okay. about what you already suspect you are capable of that mm -hmm. has been denied to you by yourself or by the people around you, the enemies in the foxhole. Confirmation. I always say I am never the genesis of somebody's breakthrough. I am the catalyst with the book. Mm -hmm. And the book is engineered to be the catalyst so that you can feel seen. The book was a three years in the making because of the construction of it so that rather than see me as the white male who's on Shark Tank, who you presume is wealthy, you see me as the 16 year old who ate government cheese and has been through the things you've been through, feels the things you feel. The whole goal being to hold up a mirror to you to confirm what you already know about yourself. I love that. One of the things I've been doing on the way out of these episodes is asking a forwarded question, meaning our last guest without knowing who our next guest is, has asked you a question. Uh, that question is, what is one thing you know will move the needle forward, but you're too afraid to do it? And maybe if that doesn't resonate with you, we could say, what was that one thing that you were afraid to do and you did it and it has moved the needle forward? Yeah, great question. So the one thing that is the greatest gift I could give myself that I still deny myself is a regular commitment to meditation because... Okay. The only truth in this world is the present. It's the only guarantee. I, talk, I think a lot about death. I have an app that reminds me I'm dying five times a day called We Croak. I love it. But for whatever reason, carving out those 20 minutes is still a struggle. Even yeah. though one of my bedrock principles is anything which is inevitable, stop being oppositional to it because you'll save so much energy, right? The problem is for meditation to be inevitable, I've had to make a firm commitment that I'm going to do it. And so it's the one thing that would uh, change everything even more. And yet I still struggle with making the commitment to do it. It's those 20 minutes. My logical mind's like 20 minutes. Like <laughs> I could, I could launch an ICBM in 20 minutes. Like, you know, and I, I get up every day, you know, 435 and then more, I, I go hard. I'm like 20 minutes. So that's, that's the very, very tactical answer to that question. Is there any doubt toward what you're worth that stops you from doing things like that. And the reason I'm asking, and you might say no to this, but for me personally, I feel like the reason I go seven days with, you know, really good clean eating. And then on the eighth day, I'm back to eating a burger or pizza or whatever. I mean, it's also hard to not eat pizza when you're still in Queens, but you know, I, I feel like there's some self-esteem in my regard as to why that stuff stops. Is that the same for you by any chance? I, to I totally think it is a self-esteem issue. I yeah. actually think back to my point about adolescence, anybody listening, when you skip the, the me, you know, you have your own reasons. Like for me, I think when you skip that sort of, you know, me phase that mm -hmm. it's very hard for you to establish boundaries about what I need. So the idea of even asserting that I need something feels flawed, feels weak. Yeah. The fact that I'm asserting, like, I need this, it's something I still struggle with, is establishing boundaries about what I need. It's almost like when I when I assert it, it's like, you know, it's almost acknowledging a, a vulnerability or fragility, which makes no sense. So I, I do think that's a self-love self issue, maybe not so much a yeah. self-esteem issue, but a, a self-love issue, self-worth. Yeah.
And then sometimes when I see people who are like borderline sociopaths and completely selfish, part of me um, respects the act of like, well, at least they understand what they want, what they need. Now, nobody should be that, and obviously, but but it is interesting to see the most extreme manifestation of somebody who established boundaries for themselves, right? And I, I love what you said, because I just posted something on social similar to this, like um, they don't award points for difficulty. And if mm -hmm. you find yourself manu manifesting complexity all around you, uh, you should consider whether you have a self-esteem problem, because you yeah. might be uh, subconsciously ensuring that you never have it easy because you don't think you deserve to have it easy. And that's another mm -hmm. thing I struggle. A lot of, I play around with the stock market with derivatives and I make such a crazy returns on it. And the reason why I do it aside from being a hobby is to be reminded that there are easier ways to make money. Like this is so stupid. I mean, it's really just a, a phone call I just made. And then the next day it's up, you know, 200%. I do a lot of that, but, <laughs> but I do same reason I ran a marathon. I ran a marathon because it doesn't come natural for me to do something that requires the application of the same effort, effort of the same pacing over a prolonged period of time. Right. I muscle through everything. Well, I do the same thing with derivatives to remind myself things could be easier. So I posted this point and it resonated with so many people. Like if you find yourselves with a bias towards complexity, it's because you might have a self-worth problem. Mm, I love that. Now, the next part of forwarding a question is having you ask our next guest a question. And I can't tell you who that is, but I'm curious what you're going to pass along. Oh, wow. Okay. In your experience, what is the single greatest unlock of human potential that is entirely within someone's control? Mm. What do you feel like that is for you? Is it self-awareness? I mean, I, I feel like it's self-awareness. I'm just, I'm the reason I want to ask somebody else is to be self-aware that I might be wrong. <laughs> to see if all my advice, I have to go back to 71 podcasts and redo everything. But just I to love see that. If, just to see if, uh, that but, is great. Uh, I, want, I want to tell one more story before we wrap up on the, uh, up, uh, about the, book. I have plenty of time. I just want to respect your time. I'm, no, no, I'm, I'm good. good. How far into it are we? Oh, we're 50 minutes. I have another, I have another 10 minutes. We can go do this. Okay, cool. Uh, so I am. Um, I, uh, this is a, a great story. A young woman, um, uh, soon after the book came out and this happens in different degrees, but she sent me a message. She's in her twenties. She's like, you know, I've been an investment banker for a really long time. I've been harboring a great idea. I read your book. I just want you to know that I quit my job today. I read mm -hmm. your book three weeks ago. I quit my job today. I was like, wow. She's like, I'm ready to go all in on, on, on what I, what I, uh, what I've been working on. So amazing story, wrote a review, you know, moved on for a bit. I get it. I get a, a, a deck, uh, four weeks ago from her. Hey, just letting you know that I'm about to launch my company that I created after I read your book, that your book confirmed I should create. And, and, uh, and she sends me the deck. Now I've looked at thousands of investments. So I could pretty quickly see the patterns that signal like, huh, serious effort actually has a shot here. She recruited two co-founders after she read the book that are amazing. One's from Stanford, two female co-founders, one from Stanford, one from NY like little geniuses, you know, like, like young, <laughs> brilliant people. And the idea was kind of great. And I've now become her investor and her advisor, and she's launching that business uh, in the fall. And that is so absolutely amazing. The, the reason why I'm so evangelical about the book is like, I know the power it has, but in terms of where I am at this moment in life, like I could either choose to accumulate more pointless credentials, or I could use the authority that I've accumulated to touch people. So I would say to anybody out there, we all have authority. We all have power and influence. We should constantly be asking, what's the highest and best use of my power and influence and authority today? Mm. It's the reason why I get frustrated with somebody like Elon Musk. I'm like, you're pushing, pushing Dogecoin? Like, how about human rights or something? So anyway, the book is my attempt to use the authority that I have, I have gained from these credentials uh, and then go ahead and show people, hopefully the codes back to the matrix with the, with the bullet scene and then be the catalyst like I was for that young woman, Isabella. I love that. If Matt lives to whatever year he wants to live to, he impacts as many people as he wants to with the books, the social, the podcast, all of that. You, you, you're there for the kids. You do everything that you want to do. But you could only be remembered for one piece of advice, meaning I walk past Matt's tombstone, and hopefully this is many years down the road, and I see this piece of advice etched into it. What would that advice be? It's probably, it's, I don't know how to say it in Latin. It's probably taken from Ralph Waldo or Emerson. It's in the beginning. Uh, it's in the beginning of uh, Emerson. I wish I could do it in Latin. But um, uh, do not seek outside thyself. Look do within. not seek outside thyself. 
Yeah, look within. The answer is there's so much unlock and arbitrage within. And I find, you know what, what sometimes I want to give people a hug when I read online that they use the words lifetime learner. Sometimes mm -hmm. I, I feel very protective of them because often it's a proxy for a never ending search of to mm -hmm. prosthetically install a super ego to tell you what to do. Like as if somebody out there just has the answers and then you read one and it works and you feel great, then you read another. And, you know, and so that is a corollary to what I'm saying. Do not seek outside thyself. Always have a bias for a reflection and to assume that you probably have the answers within inside yourself because this idea of intuition and instincts is mystical and is very real. I don't know who God is or where we're going or where we came from, but I do know that we were uh, given a lot in our factory settings that we are trained to ignore. And so that would what I'd want to be remembered for, that he was an advocate for the self, not in yeah. a selfish way, but in a way that was uh, uplifting. When was the last time your intuition served you well? Um, like every single day. Uh, yeah. It serves me well with a threat. It serves me well with a recognition that things aren't going well. Um, it just, it's like, and it's, you know, what's nice about it. There's lots of ways to be successful and there's lots of ways to be right. But I find the most gratifying way of being right when the right was born, when the in insight was born of intuition and, and instinct, and I had to act on the on an opportunity before the tipping point of evidence. Like, mm -hmm. and I love when the act of intuition was in complete contravention of conventional wisdom. So to make it very specific, like um, AI, I've been watching a groundswell of AI. I spent a lot of time being tactical and the, in the, you know, being granular. And I was watching AI, uh, you know, percolate. And I talked to my buddy and I was like, what, what is, uh, what is, um, who's got the plumbing for AI? And his answer was, you know, NVIDIA. NVIDIA has tremendous market power. It's got pricing power, monopolistic pricing power. It's going to be massive, whatever. And then, you know, you do your research and people say, oh, it's overvalued. It's a, uh, and on the eve before the earnings came out, I bought an ungodly amount of calls because <laughs> I wanted to have <laughs> everything on the line and they were expiring the next day. And, you know, the return on those was like 500% or something like that. So, and that is a degree of pattern recognition, intuition and instincts that, that contradicted people whose job it is to be right. So yeah. I, I, I love that. And I share that story, not to, not to yay me, it's to say, you know, to, to illustrate what that looks like. Absolutely. Uh, I'm going to ask you this last question because sure. I can go on for, for days here. How do you distinguish the difference between intuition and thought? Mm. I think in my mind, at least, uh, first of all, intuition uh, requires, a, there's a gap between the log logical conclusion of what has been admitted into evidence, the data you have, and mm -hmm. the conclusion you're being drawn to, right? Like, I feel like this is a pattern playing out again. And we've been here before and we're likely to be here again. I can't completely prove it because they're all little bits and pieces of data, but my conclusion feels so convicted. Mm. I think that's intuition versus thought is the thought about the data. You know, there was this and there was that, and this is what's happening, but you doesn't thought doesn't necessarily lead you to a conclusion. Sometimes your intuition leads you to a strongly convicted conclusion, which is really just all your little, uh, you know, neurons, working in concert in a way you can't put your finger on, right? They're drawing the conclusions together, but the pieces of data are so disparate that it, it's not organized, but you're so convicted in it. And I operate on that uh, system way more than any other system. That's why yeah. I always say, I have a simple line in my book, opportunity arise before the tipping point of evidence. Opportunity is the flash of lightning that is only a nanosecond. And there's a five second delay before the unmistakable sound of, of, uh, of thunder, which is data that confirms mm. the opportunity. You have to train yourself to act in the interstitial between thunder and lightning op uh, opportunity and evidence. And that is why I think I am sitting here where I am right now. I'm always willing to a little bit act to create the template myself. And that template is born of, you know, intuition. I love that. But we've been On intuition, that... unfortunately, because of the words we use, it does have like a, a very loose feeling, like it's conjecture or it's mysticism. Whereas I actually think intuition is really just disparate bits of data that we don't have the ability to tie it up in a bow. And so we call it intuition, but it actually it's 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 actually just as valid as a data driven conclusion. Yeah. And most of the greatest insights 
the green light is always intuition. It's never data. Anyone who's built something great and big in this universe was given the green light by intuition and never by data. Because if there was data to give the green light, there would be a very crowded space, you know, right? Like right now, everyone's investing in the, your Uber drivers investing in the video. But when I made the call on CNBC six months ago, there were a lot of people in it, but not when it was $280, less people than when it's at $450. And so right. that, that's, that's the bottom line. I love that. Matt, on that note, we're going to mic drop. I want to express gratitude for the opportunity. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your wisdom, your experiences, all of that. Seriously, thank you so much. Well, thanks for having me. This was awesome.